The following interview was conducted with Catherine Kathy Sullivan, the first woman to walk in space and featured speaker at the dedication of the Hall for Discovery and Learning at Purdue University on April 16, 2010. The interview took place on Thursday, May 14, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Kathy, and thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to chat with you. Uh, delighted to be with Kathleen. Okay. Let me do put one tiny correction into your sure. introduction, if I may. Go ahead. Um, the distinction that I'm delighted to hold is the first American woman okay. to walk in space, but Svetlana Savitskaya snuck outside of a Salyut station in July of that year. Okay. Thank you for correcting on that. I had seen that in a news release, and I probably mis misunderstood. Thank you. Let's start with tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. I was born in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, uh, to Donald and Barbara Sullivan. Uh, Don, my father, was an aeronautical engineer at the time, working with uh, the Curtis Wright Corporation uh, in the uh, nearby area. My mother was uh, a stay-at-home young mom who already had one child. My brother Grant was born about 16 months before me. Okay. Uh, do you have, uh, tell us about early year at school and then uh, a little bit about high school, your, uh, where you went and your course of study and students, organizations, etc. cetera? Sure. Um, right. So we stayed in New Jersey until I was about six years old. And uh, my, you know, my father, well, the, aeros the focus of aerospace was beginning already then uh, to move west. And my father was encouraged by some of the, his colleagues who had gone that direction already to relocate out to California, and uh, that appealed to him because there seemed to be more creative, advanced design work going on there than I think he foresaw coming down the road with his employer at the time. So in 1958, we loaded into the family car and did a great cross-country driving trip and adventure uh, that stopped by you know a number of the notable sites in the country and also several family locations, ending up in the San Fernando Valley area of Woodland Hills where my dad's new job was and we um, we settled in the western end of that valley in a place called Woodland Hills and my brother and I settled into elementary school uh, I started second grade once we moved into our new house and he was always just one year ahead of me in school mm -hmm. um, I would say the notable things about my early schooling are just a couple one one is uh, very early school project in about second or third grade that was a first taste of making a map, uh, just a simple map of how you walk to school. Uh -huh. uh, but I can still remember very vividly uh, how intriguing I found that whole exercise and, and faintly what I recognized that it showed me about uh, my ability to conceive of sort of the, the geometry of, of places, the geography and layout of places. So an early fascination with maps um, in late elementary school, you know, the early space program, uh, manned flights were happening, uh, as well as some of the Jacques Cousteau-ish uh, uh, big ideas about undersea habitats, and I was fascinated by both of those grand adventures of humankind. Uh, did not approach them with any more pragmatic thought about who are these people and what is that job description or how do you get there. Sure. Just really was it's the aura awesome. of it. Yeah. The aura of it. Sure. Even at that young age, and even though none, none of these participants looked like me, um, it was clearly just enthralling and uh, on the level of, of some of the amazing things humans get to do. Um, first, so I sort of did, did not really conceive crisply of the meaning of these geographic instincts of mine and, and of this uh, strong curiosity around the space and the sea programs about how did, how do they do that and how do things work. Mm -hmm. um, the meaning of those interests uh, and what, how they might re reflect talents I had did, did not really crystallize. But a family friend in about fifth grade uh, did help me crystallize an awareness uh, of an ability, an, an easy ability to absorb and learn well foreign languages. So I made a quick early theory of life at about grade five. Uh, since, since I really loved maps and was curious to get to explore and live and understand other places, and since I had a, evidently a flair for languages, my theory of action was learn a lot of languages and translate that somehow into a life uh, of this kind of exploration and discovery. <laughs> and uh, modest though that theory was, it propelled me 
uh, very well through school because I now saw this was my the first part of my understanding or my glimpsing uh, that school was not actually a thing that grown-ups did to me. It was a place where I could collect uh, knowledge and insight and where I could practice uh, uh, my own skills uh, and develop my own intelligence. It was a place where I could collect the keys to my future. Uh, so, you know, it, it had a very different feel to me than I think several of my uh, friends and neighbors. In, uh, so that theory propelled me forward for a number of years, and the next um, added point to that theory was one day when I think this was middle school now. Uh, we were exposed to various things about colleges, trying to get us to make a mental picture of you know, the purpose of high school is to get to college, as opposed to the purpose of high school is to waste time and you know, end up with no prospects. Uh, and the, the um, glint that caught my eye there was a junior year abroad program. And there was a brochure that described a university program that had locales in Italy and France Germany and and my goodness you got to go live there and to study <laughs> there and immerse there and wow <laughs> and, uh, and take all these cool courses and learn the language and then I turned over to the back of the brochure and discovered that this was so cleverly arranged that all of your credits were already mapped into your home school system so they you know you were making good progress towards your degree it wasn't a timeout and the program basically cost uh, at the way that rates were negotiated, I guess, it cost the same as your a year at your uh, home university would cost you plus an airline ticket. And I seized on that and said, hey, I, you know, they absolutely can manage to come up with an airline ticket, <laughs> my savings account, and the family's conversation had already made clear that college was a really important, uh, important investment that we would all work together to make so my brother and I could count on uh, the ability to take a college degree um, that fit in our plans, so that would work. So now I sort of, in a pragmatic sense, realize this fits within what my family is able to do, provided I can, you know, get enough employment on my own to cover the airline ticket part, and I know I could do that. And <laughs> so I want to do this. This is probably about eighth grade. So I want to do this. I now have a clear agenda for what high school is about. It's about uh, learning a lot and learning it well and uh, getting a sufficiently good grades that I can aim to get into an institution like this one and uh, not find myself relegated to a, some other place that doesn't have a program like this. <laughs> and, uh, and it also said on the back of the brochure, you know, sort of academic entry requirements were laid out at some general level. And they were, uh, you know, they were like very, very high. Well, it turns out to digress sort of leap forward in the storyline a little bit, um, I, it turns out I realized, you know, much after the fact, uh, that the program I was looking at was Stanford's program, and there was no way on God's great earth I was ever going to get to Stanford. I was, uh, <laughs> and, if, and if I could, there was no way we could have afforded it, and we, you know, mm -hmm. right at that edge, slightly too well to do to probably pull in any financial aid, and definitely not well enough to do to handle it on, on our own. Uh, and it, you know, it, it, I don't remember now if I, how much I ever spoke about this great discovery in this brochure to the grown-ups around me. Uh, you know, being me, probably not much. I tended to take these little glimpses of insight and sort of like precious stones, park them in my consciousness, and they would just be keep there. Me. <laughs> yeah, and they would keep propelling me, and they, they didn't need talked about a lot. They would kind of settle right in and just drive me forward. Uh, but you know, it's probably a very good thing that I didn't ever say it out loud because. Uh, that insight, that glimpse, uh, raised, raised, dr drove me to raise my academic targets from, you know, kind of what I was already getting because it was easy, which was sort of you know, consistent Bs and occasional A's, to I really want to get the best, put in the best effort I absolutely can and get out the best result I absolutely can because I want to do this. Mm -hmm. So I raised my target level on everything about schooling because I wanted to, because I could see where it could get me to work, to make that kind of investment at it, to put that kind of effort into it. And uh, I'm uh, uh, probably very lucky that I never said much to the grown-ups around me because I suspect one or more of them whose influence counted for a lot probably would have gently taken me aside and tried to, and poo-pooed this and tried to, you know, warn me away from 
something so silly that never could happen. Yeah. And ever, you know, ever since I re recognized that part of the story, I wonder about how many young students catch a glimpse of something that could lift their sights and aspirations the same way, and before they know it, some grown up is coming in and talking them down yeah. off of that, uh, off of that inspiration, and it's. It's such a sad prospect. Yeah, it happens too. Oh, yeah. oh um, sure. it does. So, at any rate, uh, so that carried me through high school. And, uh -huh. uh, were there any student? Cl did you have any uh, student organizations or clubs you belonged to when you were in high school? And how large was the school? Uh, I went to William Howard Taft High School in Woodland Hills, California, which was nothing short of immense. Uh, it was over four thousand students. Wow. My graduating class was over one thousand. Oh um, wow. Yeah, our out, the, the outdoor sport of those of us at the tail end of the alphabet was counting every student as they went across the stage. And as we got <laughs> to 500 and then 1,000, you know, it got louder and louder. And eventually we got loud enough to tell the big parents up in the stands were going, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, dear. And uh, uh, mainly on the basis of their Russian book. Let me pause a second, complete one part of the story. I followed my language instincts through my high school planning. We actually selected majors at Taft, and I did a college prep uh, languages major. Uh, I began taking French in eighth grade, so you know, by the beginning of twelfth grade, I had taken all the French courses the high school had, uh -huh. uh, including well, I, it, it was in advanced placement, and I began taking German in ninth grade. So I, I was pretty advanced in both French and German. Um, scored very well on the AP French test and decided to go to or UC Santa Cruz because they had a really great Russian language program. And uh, A, I was curious to try a language of a different structure and, and a different alphabet. The Cyrillic alphabet intrigued me. And B, you know, this was the late 1960s. You know, Russian clearly was a significant uh, strategic language at that time, given sure. the Cold War and all those things. And right. If I thought I was going to go make some kind of career direction out of this, it, it made sense to you know, work on a language that clearly had strategic, governmental, and military, and, and economic significance. So that, that was my game plan, and off I went to Santa Cruz. Uh, Santa Cruz had uh, you know, welcomed bright young language students, but was very insistent that they would also take some science courses. And my, my undergraduate advisor, who was this delightful French literature professor named John Hummel, uh, gave me this, this bad news, because I considered it bad news at the time. It was going to take me off course from the things I wanted to do. Um, and uh, none of my counter arguments and objections mattered for anything, just all tossed aside. And he gave me a nice little crib sheet of three courses that he had scouted over years of advising students like me uh, that were well taught, actually interesting. Um, actually seemed to teach people things of value that they enjoyed learning and not too hard, which is good for a French major. Sure. Um, and so off I went to take those. Uh, as it turns out, two out of three of those were marine science-oriented courses. And uh, both the, you know, the content and the way they were taught, the first one by Todd Newberry and the third one by Gary Griggs, uh, basically uh, those two professors and the materials they, they uh, used for their class, you gave me, let me see uh, really vividly what life as an oceanographer could be. And it didn't take me long to recognize that that pattern was exactly the pattern of travel and learning and knowledge uh, and adventure that I had dimly but strongly always dreamed about. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, before too long, I was accosting poor Gary Griggs with, you know, brilliant questions like, what do you guys do? Uh, what does it mean to be an oceanographer? I mean, it, I understand it means stand in front of freshmen and lecture. You know, what else does it mean? Uh, and by the end of my freshman year, I had decided I'm going to take a couple of really killer hard earth science courses next quarter, and if I can be any good at them, I'm changing gears and I'm going with these guys. And that's what I did. Oh, okay. Good. What, uh, how large, the, the campus, you lived on campus then? Did you? I lived, uh -huh. I was on campus for my freshman year, off campus for my sophomore year, overseas for my junior year. Oh, okay. So you did get uh, overseas then, huh? I, yes, that part of the dream didn't go away. Okay, uh, good. I sh obviously shifted to looking at uh, 
campuses or f foreign locales that now had good geology or science programs as sure. opposed to etymology or things like that. Right. And uh, the, op the best options there were Göttingen in Germany or Bergen, Norway, and Bergen had a much more oceanic bent to it. And uh, uh, not that I actually knew a, a lot by first hand, ex not that I knew anything for that matter by first hand experience about Germany, but in three or four years of studying German and reading German authors and literature, I, I felt somewhat of a fami familiarity with German history and culture and society, and none whatsoever, of course, with the Norwegian. Uh, so that, you know, piqued my curiosity to Good. a great degree, and then you added the marine dimension, and I was sold. Good. So you spent, uh, you spent a year over there? I spent one full academic year and all of the summer's bookending that. Ooh, where, what? So uh, almost, almost 18 months. Oh, and it, was it, you enjoyed it, I, I would imagine? It, it was an absolutely fabulous experience. It was not as linear, it was not as intense linear progress down, you know, the academic uh, sequence of courses as I would have made if I had stayed home in Santa Cruz, but as, as my new undergraduate advisor pointed out, and he was right, uh, that kind of experience you know, teaches you more across countless fronts than right. faculty and classrooms can ever teach you. Right. And it, it just it paid tremendous dividends. In the long run. In the long run right. on countless facets. There you go. Okay. Then you came back, and then you, you finished at Santa Cruz, came back for your senior year? That's right. I okay. came back for senior year uh, with a clear vision uh, that what I wanted to do was go uh, on for a PhD and become a research oceanographer. The, uh, you know, the, I, we had all discovered plate tectonics and continental drift in the, in around that time frame. This was a, you know, big headline news story geologically that was breaking as we speak in the North Atlantic around Iceland, areas that fascinated me and the notions that I now had crystallized a bit that, you know, what a, what a research scientist does is uh, is find or pose questions that haven't been answered yet, mm -hmm. build it, and build answers to them. Okay, sounds good. And I loved uh, I loved getting out to sea. I got a, a chance to spend several weeks, about a third of my senior year, at sea. Uh, not quite a third. Uh, three weeks of my senior year at sea, uh, helping the U.S. Geological Survey on one of their offshore survey cruises, and loved that. Oh, I bet. The oh. Notion of you know ask questions that matter about how does the earth work, develop the ways and means and tools for answering those questions, take them out to sea uh, and, you know, plow some, new, plow some new intellectual ground, add some answers to the repertoire of humankind was just really intriguing. Mm, sounds it, I would think so, right. <laughs> then what came next, uh, Kathy, after you uh, got your degree? Well, I, you know, I had... Uh, with the, with the realization that what I really wanted to do was go on and be a research oceanographer, I started applying to graduate schools, uh, East Coast, West Coast oceanographic institutions like Oregon State. I think I applied to University of Alaska, which was a much smaller program, but with some interesting things going on. Um, one of my undergrad advisors insisted I apply to his alma mater, Princeton, uh, which I did, and then and then there were interesting research projects and papers coming out from a group of Canadians, uh, some of them at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography and some at Dalhousie University. Uh, and, and since I still had this attraction towards the North Atlantic from my Norwegian experience, I applied to Dalhousie mm -hmm. and uh, was admitted to all of them. Um, and. It, well, it was admitted to all of them in the end, but uh, at first had heard from the three American schools uh, and had not heard initially from Dalhousie. And of the three American schools, when I really dug down and looked more carefully, uh, I thought more carefully about the domain of marine geology and geophysics I thought I wanted to get into. Oregon State was clearly the best choice. Uh, and so I actually had called and accepted the Oregon State offer and then Dalhousie got back to me uh, and said, oh, by the way, um, we'd actually be delighted to have you come here. Uh, and in that course of that conversation uh, and further discussion about the areas of the North Atlantic that they were working in, projects and programs that I could join right in and be a part of, um, I realized that was where I wanted to go, provided Oregon State would release me 
from a commitment already made, and uh, happily they did. Yeah, happily for me, I think mm-hmm. uh, my, my father and my uh, boyfriend of 18 months at the time were probably less than really happy with this decision. <laughs> but happily for me. Sure, sounds good. It, it, it all worked fine. Mm-hmm. Then you, did you, uh, at Dalhousie, then do, did you go for the master's and the Ph.D. then? Yeah, there. It's, normal, it's normal practice at a Canadian school to admit you for a master's, and depending how everything turns out together and the scale of the project you find, uh, you either finish that and, and then start a Ph.D., or they sort of escalate the work that you're doing oh, okay. with a Ph.D. Um, but I was patterned in the American mindset, which is different, uh, and the Americans, the American approach, is, as I had seen it at Santa Cruz, was you know the good, the really great universities, research universities in the United States and the sciences uh, are not interested in, in admitting people to master's programs. They want talents that are PhD caliber, and and so it's a you know if you left UC Santa Cruz with a master's in earth sciences, it was kind of because things didn't pan out. It was a courtesy departure degree. Because uh, you ought to go, you know, this isn't working. Uh, and so I was very clear in my mind that I, I wanted a PhD okay. and had no doubt that I had the uh, ability to get one and certainly discipline to work that hard. And uh, so when Dalhousie said, we'll admit you for a master's, I probably quite obnoxiously said, no, I'm not, you know, I'm just seriously not at all interested in a master's. I want a PhD. And uh, bless their hearts, they probably said, you know, stubborn, crazy American. Okay, you're admitted to a PhD. Come on over, uh, right? <laughs> come on over. Uh, so, I, so yes, I went up to Nova Scotia um, in about June of uh, 1973. They offered me summer employment, which I needed, uh, and it was summer employment uh, on some research cruises at sea, which was way better than the retail store job I had otherwise. Uh, so I hurried off to take that, and uh, it was fabulous. Super. Yeah. So you so you got your ended getting your PhD there. That's right. Okay. I, uh, I did, and I did end up at sea a lot, mapping uh, and doing the first inter- regional interpret first interpretation of a pretty significant sized region off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland that had not been mapped properly before, and certainly had not been surveyed and analyzed geologically. Oh, what a wonderful opportunity. Um, the career path before you came uh, to NASA, is that, uh, or did you go next? So tell us what came in the next stage. Yeah, so the career, <laughs> there is no career path before okay. school and NASA. It, it was, a, you know, an air. Did you go to NASA, a- excuse me, did you go to NASA then after you got your Ph.D.? Or yeah. Was, okay. Great. Yeah, I was actually selected. I knew I had been selected into the program before I defended my Ph.D. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, you know, that really is just a, a delightful artifact of timing that right around the, you know, the, the way NASA's search and selection timing for the first batch of shuttle astronauts fell out, uh, it, it lined up uh, about ideally, frankly, with uh, my degree progress. I think if I had been 12 to 18 months further down the road on my degree, um, I, I quite probably would have already taken a postdoc or a, or a position somewhere and yeah. you know, dug in to go make good on that and I don't know you know I don't know if I would have uh, thought about making such a profound change when I had just taken on a big new commitment probably one that I would have that I would have adored sure I understand uh, and if I'd been about a year 12 months behind I would have been too far away from my degree to be competitive I think yeah I understand okay well let's talk a little bit about your the appointment and some of the training and then talk about your mission assignments uh, your life with NASA go ahead well, you know, so so life life with NASA as an astronaut is a, you know is a pretty transformative thing. I mean, well, one I day bet. I'm a, one bet. day I'm a Mark Mark One standard and and really quite poor, uh, certainly unknown graduate student in Canada, and then there's a phone call or two, and the next thing you know, you're you know you're one of 35 new guys going into NASA, and one of the first you know six women. What we called our, we very facetiously called ourselves once we got together as a class. Um, we were sometimes fond of describing our class as nine interesting people and 26 standard white guys. <laughs> we had six women and two African Americans and Asian American, and there had never been anybody like that in an astronaut uniform before. 
<laughs> and, uh, and it's always good to not take yourself too very seriously. So we thought that was a pretty fun description. As one of the nine, well, as astronaut, period, um, I mean, this is fabulous news for your friends, your family, your employers. Um, it's a really big deal. And if you were one of the nine interesting people, it was an even way much bigger deal than that. Oh, I bet. Um, so it was um, a very wild and crazy and heady um, several days, all kind of a blur for me in Halifax, Nova Scotia, with you know waves of American press and Canadian press and everything else. You know, it was like, gosh, suddenly you are someone. It was just um, quite wild. Um, I would imagine, yeah. And they, let's see, I think we learned about that. The timing is a bit blurry in my mind. I think um, we learned of our selection somewhere in early January of 78, if I recall correctly. And within four, four to six weeks, NASA gathered our class uh, down in Houston for a formal introduction of the group to the press. And uh, by and large, none of us had met any of the others before. Okay. Uh, the inter interview cadres, NASA had done final interviews on 200 people in groups of 20. So depending how those groups fell out, you might have met one or two of the other people who made it into the class. But you know, across 200 people, you might also not have met anyone who That's was right. at the table with you. I knew one guy, one guy, Fred Gregory and I had been in the same interview cohort. And I you know, read bits in the paper as the press rolled out about some of the other people, especially the other women and, uh, the, and our African-American uh, classmates. So you know, they did the big formal press announcement, and, and that day was really when this distinction of nine interesting people and 26 standard white guys became apparent, because <laughs> after the, the formal you know, parade across the stage and big uh, group photo op, uh, the entire rest of the day, the agency offered us up for what they euphemistically call media availability. Okay. It sort of means anyone who wants to talk to you or interview you. You're 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 available. <laughs> you're available. Sure. And I and I think that started at around eleven o'clock in the morning and I'm pretty sure that our twenty six standard white guy colleagues were out the door by about twelve thirty, having a hamburger and a beer for lunch and, and an open rest of the day. And the nine other people we were there till I don't even remember when. You know, <laughs> seven I, bet. I bet, I bet. Because I'm sure we covered the news cycle at the six right. o'clock news cycle. Yeah. Um so again, you know, I mean that part of that part of the learning curve. I'm mean, at the ripe old age of 26, uh, a very freshly minted PhD, uh, suddenly put into uh, suddenly given such a you know, a prestige a title with such prestige and cachet, and thrust into the limelight in uh, you know what is a a visible and uh, and and scrutinized. And, and has to be also an authoritative and responsible role, um, that, that alone was an interesting part of the learning curve. Uh, I would think so. I would think I mean, so. It's, it's, it's one thing to be on a research ship at sea and have the captain and the ship trust you to have the con and you'd be giving rudder orders and positioning orders and, and all that kind of stuff. And you have, to, you, know, you have to live up to that responsibility and authority and carry that off well. Uh, but you take that little nugget of experience uh, in a position of responsibility and authority, and suddenly, you know, it's times a thousand or more to uh, carry it off with these kind of responsibilities on this kind of stage. Um, so there's this burst of this day and a half or so in Houston, which was the you know the the uh, craziness of the press stuff, and then the mon the mundane mat matters of civil service paperwork, personnel, personnel paperwork, HR system things. Uh, again, as a 26-year-old grad student, you know, questions I had, man, I had never even considered, like, <laughs> you know, which of these insurance plans do you want? <laughs> what, what is this insurance? I understand what you you're know, talking what, about. What retirement election do you want? I'm 26. I don't even think I can spell the word retirement yet. I so felt the, the same whole, I felt the same way years ago. I had no thought along those lines. <laughs> yeah. So no. the whole thing, the yeah. whole day visit was this you know crazy wild surreal sort of thing and then we plunged I plunged back into the final months of finishing up and defending my PhD huh. and uh, which what happened which happened in May of that year and physically relocated to Houston in June 
uh, or several weeks, I came down there several weeks earlier than we had to, uh, basically because I was broke. And I figured I'd better find an apartment, settle in, and get signed on quickly so that a paycheck starts, because otherwise right. it's pretty grim. Um, and off we went. So uh, the way NASA does this uh, still largely follows the same pattern. Um, for the first year, you have been selected as an astronaut, and that's your classification in the agency. But for the first year, they call you an astronaut candidate. And they had organized what basically was a one-year-long, comprehensive, grad intense, compressed graduate school for astronauts. So you think of all of the various scientific and technical topics that in any way have something to do with space flight from you know, physiology to atmospheric physics to en engineering and propulsion to meteorology and oceanography. You're going to get a, kind of a first year grad student dose of all of that. In one year? In one year. Right. Okay. You know, wow. On, by contracting some of the best uh, technical experts and teaching experts uh, across the country. Uh, in, I mean, in our case, none of this was there, there really weren't even workbooks on this yet. They, there may have some more prepared materials now, a, a library of such things for the classes that come in nowadays, but they sure didn't when we did. It was just, um, you know, get, get the best experts across the country, have them compressed down to a series of X number of lectures, two, two to four hour blocks, and, uh, and that's your year. You're mm -hmm. going to learn about the agency, you're going to travel to uh, most of the major NASA, NASA field sites. We've got to get you. Uh, the basic training needed to start doing underwater simulations for spacewalk-related work, how to get you trained up in the, uh, in the T-38 aircraft, so you can begin to develop both your, continue your flying proficiency or develop it if you didn't have it, and also start building the crew, you know, the crew interaction patterns that are common to the spaceflight uh, arena. Um, so it was, it was a fabulous, exhilarating, intense year. Um, there had been a long hiatus between um, the last astronaut selection and the arrival of our class. So the other thing they did, I think more intentionally and consciously, and certain, more uniquely certainly for our class than any of the subsequent ones, they, they basically asked the question, how do, we, how do we ensure we've transferred you know, the tacit knowledge, the experiential knowledge that uh, people have gained through Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo? And the answer became, we're, we're going to pick a set of, of the Mercury missions, a set of the Gemini missions, and a set of the Apollo missions, and we're going to put on half-day-long symposiums about that mission. Why was it planned that way? Where was it in the sequence? What had happened before? What were the issues that, of the day that this crew was navigating while also preparing for the flight and getting ready to achieve these mission objectives? And then how did the mission go? And, you know, what did you, what did you learn technically? What technical challenges had to be overcome? What operational issues cropped up? What inter-organizational challenges had to be solved? What leadership uh, challenges did that pose? Personal leadership, managing yourself, uh, command leadership, all of those things. Wow, uh, yeah. And, and we just had, I'll give you, I mean, my best example, my favorite example of that was a day that I spent my morning uh, getting some of my flight hours uh, in the T-38 jets because we had to get 15 hours a month. So in the morning I'm flying with a couple of colleagues in a pair of small jets uh, doing our practices, doing our practice and getting our time in. And in the afternoon, uh, in the afternoon I'm in our conference room all day listening to Neil Armstrong and Mike Collins talk about Apollo 11. Wow, how about that? What a day, huh? No wonder that sticks in your mind, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I'm not the only one. I mean, yeah. with, with Tom Stafford telling about Apollo 10 and right. their close approach to the moon and they almost locking up the gimbals on, on ascent and having to take over command. I mean, you know, the near misses, the, the incidents, the anomalies, the near misses, the, you know, the, the inside stuff and the way they dealt with it. And right. I, I can't think there clearly couldn't have been a better way to no, no. help all of us appreciate. It teaches you the culture of the organization. Right. Uh, you know, it gives you great examples to look at of, uh, of uh, the leadership and management techniques that uh, you two are going to need to be successful in this arena. It was right. great. 
and they're and they're pleased to to share it, and and so it's a two way street. You're both learning, sharing hey, all, things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those are always those right. are always two two way streets, and all of these were done. You know, they were astronaut only. Uh, you know, internal working sessions. So you know, there was a level uh, everyone could trust in a candor right. um, of things that makes you, know, you have to be able to do that, or there's you lose a lot of the potential value. Right, exactly. Do you want to? Do you make? Can you make a comment how you were selected for uh, a couple of the, the um, flights that you're on, um, or any comment that you'd care to share with, with the researchers well, on that? Well, astronaut selection process. Uh, I mean, flight selection process. Right. Let's put it that way is. Um, I, I think someone might be able to describe it, what it is and how it works to you, but you know, I I can't, and I've never heard okay. one of my colleagues say that it's it is in various ways, and I think. It, in other words, it varies. No, to, oh, no, no, it's a it's a black box. Okay, I understand. It is. I think it deliberately. I mean, it clearly is the head of the astronaut office, uh, who is an astronaut who looks at the, the talents. Uh, sure. Okay. Characteristics and looks at the flight assignments coming up, and and makes a you know a, a mental map of I'm I, you know I Kathy's spacewalk certified and and we're going to need someone an experienced spacewalker here and they need to put a rookie in there with her to get up or you know someone's been doing yeoman's job and and there's a really sweet flight coming up and uh, I want to slot them in there they'll be a great contributor and they kind of deserve it right. all sorts of factors like that right they come into come into play and in putting on the team putting the team together that's right and and our uh, you know I think past I suspect passed down a bit from astronaut office chief sure. and astronaut office chief but you know it is well, I guess what I'm taking a long way about to say is it is not procedural and okay. it's not uh, you it's know, well it's out. well or thought out it is terribly well thought right. out. It is a tremendous well organized. Right. Um, and, and then, of course, it gets cross-checked, cross-checked and uh, chopped on by sure. the head of the Johnson Space Center and, the, and I'm sure up at NASA headquarters. But it is not formulaic, and it is not. Uh, there's not a grading sheet. There's not a rubric right. that you could look at as an astronaut and say, given how I up and I score like this, and therefore I should get this flight. Right. And and it is. I, it is, in my opinion, wise, uh, very wise, that right. it's not done that way. But it does have the net effect of making the whole thing a little bit like a black box. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good comment. Uh, moving along a little bit, how about could you make a comment um, about when you came for the dedication of the of the um, Discovery Learning Research Center? Did you make any comment on it? I understand you had some students that came from one of the schools up in, the nor in Indiana that came to that. Yeah, but my whole visit at Purdue uh -huh. uh, was this your April. first visit? Excuse me, was your first visit at to Purdue? It was my first visit okay. to Purdue, uh, and quite delightful. Uh, Good. With the fact that the weather cooperated well enough, <laughs> I was able to uh, come over there in my own little two-seat plane instead of driving or riding airline cushions. So that made it extra fun. Sure. Um, and of course, the aviation department at Purdue was pretty renowned in flying circles and astronaut circles, so it was quite fun to come land at Lafayette Airport. Oh, yes, right. Um, President Reagan did the same thing. There you go. His airplane is bigger than mine. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it's, you know... It's, it's nice to have been very able to come. Pretty, yeah, yeah, it was... It, I was struck by how uh, pretty the whole campus environment is. It really has a nice feel to it. it yeah, I, I like the way I like campuses to kind of hang together. Sure. A bit of a distinct boundary to them, but not too removed from from the world around. So I found it physically a very appealing place in terms of landscape and architecture. Um, and of course, the, everybody I met there was just delightful. Oh, yeah. um, I thought the you know the the Discovery Center was really a fascinating place. The whole notion of that kind of design to really make possible. Uh, some, you know, much, if I may, much more scientific, um, scientifically structured research around education. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really cool idea. Yes. Uh, it was neat to see how it's been implemented. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a couple, several busloads of high school students uh, from somewhere several hours away in Indiana. So, uh, I, you know, it was impressive to me that the school made the effort that they did to get down there, and I'm sure the kids were grateful to be out of school oh. all day long. <laughs> Oh, always. they enjoyed it, I'm sure. Always. <laughs> Get a chance you know, to meet you. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was just, just 
an absolutely delightful Good. time. And of course, I'm always glad to uh, help out my friend Franz Cordova, who you are fortunate to have as your president these days. Uh -huh. So that was also fun to get to spend a little time with her. Sure, that's right. <laughs> um, another couple things. Uh, the Center for Science and Industry, could you make some count? You were the president and chief executive officer. Could you tell us what that involved? Yeah, and maybe in doing that, let me maybe connect the dots back okay, good. by NASA years. So good. I started at NASA in 1978, completed the candidate year, uh, and our class was, of course, in line behind the several dozen astronauts who've been uh, waiting since Apollo uh, for a flight. So our class began to fly, um, or the shuttle flew its first flight in 1981, and then our class started getting slotted in um, the seats in 1983. Uh, I landed my first assignment for uh, what eventually became October of 1984, and that's the flight that included uh, the spacewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, the main objectives of that flight were all Earth sciences, uh, and one uh, engineering validation project, which is the one that, that drove the, uh, the spacewalk, uh, was assigned then to the Hubble, right after that, to the Hubble Space Telescope flight, which originally had a late 1980s launch date, uh, that of course moved around a lot after the Challenger accident and uh -huh. ended up not flying that mission until 1990. Uh, but the five years in between my assignment and that launch, I worked very closely with Bruce McCandless and a host of other EVA engineers and, and Lockheed uh, personnel and NASA Goddard personnel to be sure that everything really was ready to be able to repair the telescope on orbit through its 15-year life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, of course, is a story that has uh, a plan and an assignment that has succeeded brilliantly with the Hubble servicing missions and, and everything that Hubble has sure. generated scientifically. Oh, yeah, right. One more flight after that um, in 1992, which, again, was Earth sciences oriented, uh, atmospheric science and phys uh, chemistry and physics. Uh, and just before that flight, in January of that year, uh, a colleague who had been serving as the chief scientist of NOAA uh, called me to say that she was uh, needing to step down from that position for family reasons and she wanted to put my name forward as her replacement. Uh, I agreed and ended up nominated to that job in April of 92 by President Bush uh, 41. Uh, and shifted up to Washington on assignment from NASA uh, and began to get familiar with NOAA. Uh, of course, there was an election in 1992, which that President Bush did not win, uh, and I stayed on it uh, in Washington and at NOAA and uh, found the right way to make the argument uh, to the incoming team uh, that I still wished to have and would be a good pick for uh, the NASA NOAA chief finest job. And so for 90 officially from 93 to 96 uh, served as the chief scientist at NOAA. Okay. Uh, oh, Ohio has um, one of the country's first uh, and, and, and most outstanding hands-on science centers is COSI, the Center of Science and Industry in Columbus. It dates back to the mid-60s. And they were looking for a new president in the 95, 96 time frame. And, uh, eventually uh, landed on me through their search firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, you know, we interviewed there, I interviewed there in October 96 and, or sorry, October 95, and the process carried on from there until I moved out here in uh, May of 1996 and took the reins at COSI. And the crux of my 10 years at COSI was to, um, was to build a $125 million new building. Wow. Bite a few blocks away from the original facility, and and then you know manage manage the total transition of the organization, everything from programs, education programs and exhibits to the internal business processes of the museum. Uh, you know, transform and modify all of that appropriately so that and, and effectively, so that we could draw the size of audience that we need and function with the effectiveness that we need. You know, to be a healthy and surviving organization. And I'll save you all the intervening details and just say that COSI Today is rated by Parent Magazine as the number one science center in the country. Super. Is it in Columbus? 
Kathy? It is in Columbus. Oh, okay, I just wanted to double check. To, okay. Whereabouts is it located? Uh, is it near right, the... Right. What? Right downtown on the West Bank. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I originally was born in, not in Columbus, but born and raised in the suburbs of Cleveland, but it's been a long time since I've been in Columbus. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, but I can share that with my sister who's got some children. Um, okay. Go ahead. Move on. Uh, and you stayed um, there? Well, I stayed there from 96 to, uh, oh, yeah, well, almost exactly a decade, 96 to just shy of, of 10 years, uh -huh. and then was lured over to the university where... Uh, Patel, which is you know, the largest private research organization in the world and headquartered here in Columbus, Patel had given the university a multi-million dollar gift to establish a program in uh, math, and, math and science education policy, and uh, which had which had not come had not come with a detailed definition of what that ought to be, and uh, the president of the university decided that the way to get that detailed definition was in fact to persuade me to come figure it out. Okay. So Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. She recruited me to be the first, um, the inaugural president, or the inaugural director. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Um, can you um, and are some of the, can you tell some of the things that you're sort of involved in? Is, is there an affiliation with, is it with the John Glenn School of Public Affairs? Are you, is there? We, oh. we are located and we are housed in the John Glenn okay. School of Public okay. Affairs. Okay, okay, okay. <coughs> Excuse okay. me. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, do you have uh, family, uh, family, any uh, um, family? Did you want to make any comments on that? I usually ask uh, people, uh, relatives or family? Or, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. A swarm of cousins. My father was the youngest of 12 in a fine Irish family. <laughs> so, a wonderful swarm of cousins uh, far flung across, uh, across the land. <laughs> My brother lives out in uh, Southern California, not far from where we grew up, uh, with his wife and three, three kids, two, ne two nephews and a niece. Very good. And, uh, and a tremendous and wonderful family of friends here in good. the Columbus. Area. Super. Okay, sounds good. Uh, talk. Let's talk some about your awards and honors. You are a member. Are you still a member of the National Science Board? Uh, technically, my term ended last Wednesday. Oh, okay. But uh, President Baring is is on the National Science Board. Actually, technically, <laughs> his term ended last Wednesday too. Oh, is that right? Okay, he's been on. Uh, yeah, so he's been on it for. Um, they are six-year terms. Okay. Uh, Steve actually did eight years because he he was first appointed to. Bill and an uncompleted term. Oh, okay, okay, all right. So there's another Purdue connection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, any other uh, honors or awards that you'd like to comment on? I know you've given quite, imagine quite a few talks speaking as well, which you enjoy yeah, doing. Yeah, I, I do, especially to educational audiences, I do enjoy sharing the perspectives and lessons that I've picked up along my circuitous path. Um, you know, I have been uh, honored and delighted to receive an awful lot of a very kind, uh, kind of wonderful recognition and honors. Uh, and you know, the list is embarrassing. It's an embarrassment of riches. Um, but I guess is there several do mean a bit more to me. Uh, at, I guess as is common, you know, when awards that your peers think about and bestow. Um, you know, not just to everyone who ever had a certain title or did a certain job, but with some additional right. extra discernment or extra, extra judgment are, you know, are very meaningful because your, you know, your professional peers tend to know your great sides and, and also right. your stumbling blocks, and they've seen you perform and deal with all of them. That's right, so and it makes it even extra special. It makes it very special. Right. So I, I would say um, you know, the U.S. Navy Memorial Foundation's Lone Sailors Award, um, is one I really value, and um, the National Air and Space Museum trophy given the inaugural year that, that that was given in 1985 is an awfully special thing. And then uh, I <laughs> I have uh, been delighted to be inducted into a number of halls of fame. Very nice. Well, I would hope so. I'm sure you are. <laughs> well, it's quite wonderful. So really. Um, uh, and 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 at the end of those, I would highlight in particular the Astronaut Hall of Fame, 
and the Women Aviators Hall of Fame. Um, and quite to like Blake, I, keep, I do always appreciate it a lot when I find my, uh, my, what I sometimes consider my former life in oceanography is still, I may say former, but the oceanography world, uh, I keep discovering very much actively claims me as their own. So uh, I'm in the Women Divers Hall of Fame. And uh, so there, there are a number that are just super. Those, those are really nice. That's very, that's nice to share. That's really good. Yeah. Um, any hobbies or special interests? Uh, like, I read, I read voraciously. Okay. Um, I have that little, nice little two seat super decathlon, which I love to play around with. <laughs> uh, and um, um, dabble with some creative photography from time to time. Oh, good. And uh, and I'm fond of saying that I, I do play golf, I, but I play it badly, but with great humor. <laughs> and enjoyment at the same time. And, yep, and great <laughs> enjoyment, and I'm, and I'm fabulous company. Fabulous company, <laughs> and, and even better comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely said. How about an outstanding event? You can have more than one. Sometimes when I raise that question, they say, do I have to have one? I said, no, you can have more than one. Oh, man, I, you know... Anything I, that's special that you yeah, you don't you don't have enough pages. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you want to you don't want to focus in on one, then we'll let it go. Then. Um, well, you know, you you're you'd be hard. It would be hard. I'd be hard pressed to pick something. That's right. I know. More outstanding than my first launch, except maybe my first landing, except maybe my first space flight. Except maybe, <laughs> yeah. Right. Just, I understand, but you made a comment. That's okay. Um, yeah. Then I thought in the closing that science and technology, engineering, math. Uh, sort of a look at the 21st century. Do you make any comments on that? The STEM thing? STEMs and science? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I am tremendously heartened by the fresh energy and momentum that seems to have gathered uh, both within government and communities and uh, corporations and foundations around STEM education. Uh, there, mm -hmm. have been, there have been reports by blue panels of blue, blue ribbon panels of wizards, you know, for 20 some years um, cautioning and decrying and urging the country to realize that it is increasingly important for the level of competency in, in these habits of mind and in these uh, fields, uh, more, way more of our students, way more of our young kids need to get a good healthy dose of that. The overall the floor, if you will, the, the least level of performance that is general in our students needs to come up. Um, and we need to find ways to do that that don't boil down to you know, tightening the ceiling on students who maybe have an easier time of it or a more natural aptitude. But in the century we are now in, I think imagining that one can have a productive and effective life with uh, good quality of life and family security, imagine that you can do that without some significant competency in these skills and these habits of mind is about the same as saying that you can have a healthy life without breathing well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I, I just, I think it's so important that we recognize this and this is, it is not about uh, some effete union or guild of people saying we've got the only things that matter, it's just about the complexity of the world around us, the complexity of questions and challenges that we uh, that we are going to confront as citizens, as parents, uh, as workers, uh, and, as, and as a country, as communities, mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's about making sure that you know, all of our citizenry uh, has has the capacity to engage as citizens and workers and and. Uh, and family members right. Good productive point. and be productive, be right. effective and productive, right. the issues that come their way. That's right. Uh, and, and, and it is directly and inextricably coupled uh, and will be coupled to how, to our country standing among nations. That's, mm -hmm. I guess, the simple way to say it. Sure. Very net, good. net, our, our standing among nations, uh, we, we hang our hat on uh, being the innovation nation. You know, we're not going to be able to outcompete China on headcount or on uh, you know, lots of things like that. We have, we have to, we say to ourselves, uh, be intent on being and remaining the innovation nation. And that is fabulous rhetoric. 
Uh, but, you know, my amateur looking back at the history of earlier innovations, it, you, need a, you need the bright scientific and technological insights and capacities. You also need the innovators in the sense of the people that integrate capacities together and, and have sort of a vision of how those respond to some need. And then you need, you know, the supporting cast of, right. of craftsmen, of manufacturers, of everything else that act activates all of that, actualizes right. all of it, makes it real right. uh, and, and tangible and gets it out into practice, into play, into the marketplace. And I just, you know, wonder how we really, will we, how will we, how will we continue to garner the benefits of being the innovation nation if we don't have sizable uh, sectors of that entire ecosystem of innovation alive and vital and healthy right. uh, on our soil. I, it's a, it's a, I think a key question for the future course of the country. All right, good point. Kathy, anything that I forgot to, uh, I think that makes a nice closing, but is there anything I forgot to ask or anything in addition you'd like to say? It's been a fun conversation. I think we've covered a good part of the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate that. Don't hang up because I'm going to log off now and make a comment. Thank you very much.